Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist. Okay, we are looking for Meet the Press. Okay, tonight's uh, talk is going to be on the coverage of the uh, Republican uh, presidential primaries. Uh, I'm asking how well are we informed uh, by our media. I'm asking, uh, in my view, we are getting virtually no information on real policy issues. Uh, in my view, um, the focus has been on the horse race electability versus a candidate's impact on our country's direction. And we ask, what is the media not telling us? What uh, are they failing to inform us on? So it's a lot to cover, and I'll try to do it quickly. In my view, the real issue is U.S. competitiveness long term. I view, believe that military-related debt is killing everything else, yet no candidate will touch a sacred cow, with the exception, of course, of Ron Paul. Uh, another major concern is poverty. Our poverty rate is one of the highest in the world right now at about 20%. Uh, which uh, leads to a, de a degraded workforce, so we're less competitive in that respect. Uh, higher health costs, because poor people tend to be uh, sicker. Uh, higher incarceration costs, because many crimes are poverty-related. People actually end up in prison for drugs are poor. Rich people don't go to prison for drugs because they don't get caught. Uh, and when they do, they get slapped on the hands. Um, and then there's the issue of education. Obviously, with poverty, it damages education and vice versa, and our education system is getting hammered. Uh, so uh, let me just prove some of this to you briefly. Um, let's go over here to U.S. public sector. Uh, the U.S. public sector, 38% of it is corrections, criminal justice, and defense related. Um, 21% is all other public spending there is in the whole of the United States, including uh, county, municipal, state. It's all been added into this. Um, and uh, public health care spending, 29%. K-12 education is roughly the same size as the interest payments on our overseas wars. So this whole 38%, if we were like other countries, would be more like 15%. Uh, uh, so let's go through that. <clears throat> so in terms of scoring and standardized testing, um, the U.S. comes in out of 30 countries. It comes in dead last in math, uh, 23rd in science, and 17th in uh, reading. Uh, so that's a very serious problem. In terms of prisoners, we have 23.6% uh, of all the world's prisoners, 2 million. China, with a population four times as big as ours, has less prisoners than we do. Uh, Russia is a similar in incarceration rate to the U.S., which is not particularly comforting. India has a tiny fraction of our prisoners, to, uh, and they have four times our population, um, and so forth. So we have a serious tax on economy from our, our forward deployed military during peacetime because the war on terror is just a few bands of extremists. We had just as many bands of extremists in the Bay Area alone in the 70s as we do in the whole world that we're fighting. Now we had about 10 armed revolutionary groups just in the Bay Area. We managed to do it without destroying our economy and destroying all of our rights. Uh, so I think that then we have the problem that of the of failure to create real wealth. Um, the military industrial complex doesn't create real wealth. Um, uh, fire were our big industries, which are finance, insurance, and real estate. None of them actually produce any real wealth. And of course, incarceration certainly doesn't produce any real wealth. So a very tiny amount of our population producing real wealth, where what we need is uh, manufacturing, research and development, uh, things like that. Because uh, nuclear weapons are 1950s technology. The technologies that will be emerging in the next eight years will be able to prevent nuclear attacks and do very weird and creepy things, um, I assure you. Uh, okay, so, uh, and on PBS recently there were talk about being able to erase memories and replace them in rats and embed chips and stroke victims' heads and all sorts of things. So now we're going to look at the week of uh, January 14th. 
And in my view, um, there were two big pieces of news. Ron Paul's uh, rise, uh, he came in third in Ohio with 21% of the vote. I'm sorry, Iowa, 23% and New Hampshire. And he is now in third place in South Carolina. South Carolina was considered a tough state for him. Uh, the media did uh, failed to uh, even mention the fact that he won by 54% the Texas straw poll, as he had won the California straw poll. Uh, instead mentioned that Santorum uh, was voted in a different poll uh, of conservative voters. Uh, now Romney, this clear front runner, uh, his father was the CEO of American Motors. His father ran for president. Uh, he has an estimated net worth of $250 million. Uh, so we can't really say that Romney has any particular virtue or merit because he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. You would have to be incompetent not to make money uh, coming with a background like he had. So I'm not too impressed about his work experience because he didn't um, he didn't uh, uh, make anything on his own. He had a tremendous advantage over the rest of us when he was born. And in my opinion, the real contest is between the status quo and one non-establishment candidate, Ron Paul. And Ron Paul is unifying his base around the concept of freedom, uh, which is that we can create alliances that will allow us to be free. And on that note, I would like to just play this. Yeah. And there you go. Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. And that's where we're at, I'm afraid. We have nothing left to lose. We've lost our rights. We've lost our economy. We've lost our upward mobility. So we have to band together, conservatives and progressives, and gut this corrupt government. Uh, and be aware of the fact that for a limited amount of time we cannot do mass spending for the common good through government because it's corrupt. All the other candidates' positions, if you looked at their budgets over 10 years, in my opinion, they would be virtually indistinguishable from each other in reality. Whereas Ron Paul, if he was put in the executive, would, they, would have the real ability to trim military spending drastically and at the very least bring it on home, as he has said. So the, uh, we'll go into the uh, Sunday programs in a second. The apparent talking points of the media, first is to simply ignore his candidacy entirely. Uh, then to call him wacky, when he actually, uh, from an empirical uh, research-based approach, uh, has made a lot of predictions that turned out to be much more accurate than anyone else's. In 2002, he predicted the housing bubble, which didn't collapse till 2007. Uh, he has said that and uh, government subsidizing things ends up driving its costs up, and it's been true in education. Uh, and uh, so at any rate, uh, it was an undeserved epithet, wacky, in my view. Uh, and it's certainly not very, uh, uh, it, it's really dismissive of the fact that uh, Ron Paul's candidacy, similar to Obama, drew a lot of enthusiasm from the youth. The difference is that Obama hasn't done any of the things he would do. He's done the opposite. He's become a neocon. Um, then they go on to say he's unelectable. Apparently he's unelectable because the corporate power structures don't want us to vote for him. Then back to don't, doesn't exist, where they went into this uh, talking point of uh, all of the networks said exactly the same thing. There is a top tier of candidates, and they mentioned the first, second, and fourth, and excluded the third place person. Um, he was given only 88 seconds in a 90-minute debate when he was in uh, the third place. Uh, now there's a talking point saying that he won't run as a third-party candidate because if he does, the Republicans will maul his son, Rand Paul. Um, who they? Uh, so this is, I don't know who came out with this talking point and why it's not attributed to anybody. And everyone's saying he's going to get to deliver an address at the Republican convention. And I wonder where do these talking points originate from? So in the case of Meet the Press, they managed to do an entire 90-minute episode the day after Ron Paul won the Texas straw poll. He was rising in the polls the day that he was endorsed by a prominent Tea Party uh, uh, senator uh, uh, in the South Carolina legislature, had very favorable 
coverage from the two uh, 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 senators from South Carolina, DeMint, who is highly respected by conservatives. Uh, and uh, they managed to get all the way through 90 minutes without mentioning him once, which is a real achievement. David Gregory should be given the award for best lap dog of his corporate masters. Uh, so I was looking into, so who exactly is doing this? Uh, Face the Nation and ABC's uh, George Stephanopoulos program were identical. There was a complete effacing of any mention of Ron Paul. Even though, as I showed you, I believe, in the Real Clear Politics example, I'm not sure, that, let me get to that. The reason that the news is so big on Paul um, is because of this trend line we're about to see. <clears throat> So, Paul is in third place right now in South Carolina, and it wasn't considered his strongest state. Um, and if you look at these graphs at the very end, Paul, uh, Paul is going up, Santorum's going down. Uh, Gingrich is uh, going up slightly after dropping hugely, and uh, Romney is uh, holding strong. Uh, so the idea of, of managing to get through an entire show without mentioning Paul uh, is uh, is very interesting. So I wanted to look at who owns these media companies. So let me see if I can get you that information. So here's some new research I've done. Uh, let's see if I can get to it. Okay, so I, I don't know if I showed this to you before or not, but the problem with U.S. competitiveness this is uh, the economies of the world, the main economies. Right now, the U.S. and its allies represent 59% uh, and uh, non-allies 41%. So let's look what we got. Uh, these are in billions, 14 uh, trillion U.S., China 8.8. .8, I consider them Japan, India, Germany, Russia, U.K., France, Brazil. In 2050, it will line up quite differently. And the uh, non-U.S. allies will be the vast majority. Um, and uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers revised a prediction that showed actually that we would be 11th economy and made us third uh, just in a two-year period. And these are their predictions in terms of as these emerging seven economies overtake, uh, to overtake us. Uh, and um, uh, let's see here. So uh, Mexico overtakes Germany, Indonesia uh, overtakes France. Uh, so what they're showing is these are going to be the way the economies stack up in the year 2050. We will, uh, uh, in this one, uh, the MER ranking, or second, um, and then they have another method of ranking, which is adjusted based on purchasing power, in which case we'll be third. Um, and uh, so, in my view, we have to uh, pull down our military spending to be strong militarily because we need to build our economy because we're in peacetime. Um, and so how this stacks up militarily, this is our current, U.S. and its allies currently represent 79% of global military spending. That doesn't include all sorts of off books, things like the CIA. Um, and then, um, so, so we're going to get wiped out. Now, let me see here.